Well, let everybody sit down and we will begin. Shall we start? Let us start. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good to have all of you here this morning, August 18th. A little breeze going on. Temperature. Hey, it's below 100. So hey, ooh, a little cold. Yeah. Want to want to welcome you all here. Um, our snacks. Kathy brought our snacks. Give her a hand. I have a number of announcements, and here I go. Let's see. First off, on your table, each of you should have received an email on this, but the congregational letter with the proposed budget, there's two copies or one copy on each table. Those are for you if you want a hard copy of that. The congregational meeting will be right after the second service in the main on September 15th, I believe. And uh, you'll want to uh, check this out. If you have any questions on this budget, do not ask me. There, <laughs> there, that takes care of that. So there's a go, you have the budget. <clears throat> this Saturday, CARS is taking uh, uh, maintenance requests, and they'll be working on cars, Christian Auto Repair Service. So again, this is a ministry church-wide, highly focused on all of us here. If you have any minor maintenance that you need to do for your vehicle, call the church office ahead of time so that they can be ready on that. Okay, so that's this Saturday. Speaking of that, Labors of Love will start back on Saturday, September 7th. There are cards in the middle there. If you have a need, you need to fill that out. Leave the card on the table. I will pick it up afterwards and make sure they receive it. So Labors of Love will start back on September 7th. Um, you have noticed as you walked in here, there is activity in the hallway. This is a ministry fair that will be this Sunday as well as next Sunday. Um, so after we're, we're done, you might want to cruise around and chat with the folks there. You'll see different ministries. There are sign-ups that you can do like for women's ministry or men's or community groups and so forth. There'll be service opportunities available for you also. So be sure and do that. Okay. On August 27th is the ICM banquet. Okay, that's on a Tuesday, a week from this coming Tuesday. It's a great, great opportunity to hear about how this ministry, Dave Chantness, leads this. He'll be speaking how this prepares leaders in Africa, and I believe even in the Middle East, but especially in Africa. So this is a great opportunity for you uh, to really hear about that. It's Tuesday, August 27th, and if you need a ticket, you can go to the website and get that online, unless you know some folks, and if you do that, hey, you need to be here on August 27th. Are there any other announcements before I move on? Good, okay. <laughs> Carol, come on up. Carol wa File wants to talk to you all about cheerleaders and give her a rousing. A rousing uh, welcome. Thank you. I have actually been a cheerleader of women most of my life, so it's kind of interesting that I find myself in a position to lead the cheerleader ministry 
here at River Lakes uh, Community Church. I've been involved with them the last couple years in the capacity of getting to uh, teach and share and come alongside, and that has been a great honor. This year, what we're planning to do in cheerleaders is not a lot different from the last few years. Um, it's a well-oiled machine, and several of the ladies in here make that happen, and it's a real honor to um, step in and lean into their leading uh, for what it is we do. There's a verse out of Psalm 31, and it's verse 7, and it says this, I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love because you have seen my affliction and you have known the distress of my soul. There are three words in there that I love. I will rejoice and be glad in your steadfast love. You have seen my affliction and you have known the distress of my soul. Seen, known, and loved. That's our theme for this year, and we're going to be unpacking that each of the Saturdays that we meet with uh, some teaching and sharing from within the church body, within the community. And if you are a mature single woman or a widow and you have not taken advantage of stepping in and joining those ladies on Saturday, but encourage you to come along and find a friend to bring with you and sit and enjoy the fellowship and the company and the encouragement um, again, it's a great honor and privilege for me to get to be part of this. I just think God has a sense of humor and the fact that I love cheerleading. Uh, there's a ministry here called Cheerleaders. So um, whether you belong to that group or know somebody who could be there, please encourage them to come and join us. We would love to have them and welcome them in. Thank you so much. Thank you. Real fast, uh, when will cheerleaders be starting? September 21. So ladies, and it will meet right here. And, uh, you know, it's a great time for all the ladies to meet. So really encourage you for that. Thank you so much, Carol. Um, we're going to sing a couple of hymns now. Sing them a cappella here, which means we'll have to sing it a little bit louder. They're wonderful hymns. And we're going to start with one called Heaven Came Down. In fact, let me, let me, I need to borrow. Thank you. This was written in 1961 based on the passage Psalm 97, 6. The heavens declare his righteousness and all the people see his glory. Um, it was written by a man named John Peterson. He was, um, uh, became a preacher and evangelist, but before that, um, he worked in a factory, a machine shop. He loved to sing. And the machine shop was very loud, so he sang louder. And he did that again and again, and he got to where he lost his voice. Um, he realized then that God wanted him to go from singing, because he thought he was going to be a singer, to actually writing hymns. And so from that, uh, he wrote this song. It was written in 1961. He was at a conference in Pennsylvania, and it was a, a time where people could give a testimony. And an old gentleman came up. He had a name. His name was Old Jim. <laughs> old Jim, okay. <laughs> he rose to his feet, and he told how he had come to Christ. And he said, it seemed like heaven came down and glory filled my soul. That's how he described it. And so right away he says, that's it. And he wrote the song, completed the song as well as the tune within a week. And here we have this wonderful, wonderful hymn. So let's sing it. You all know, that. You all know this, don't you? Yeah. They won't say that in the main. Oh, no, no. 
All right, here we go. I'll help you out. One, two, three. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend, he met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy I am telling, he made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Born of the Spirit with life from above into God's family divine. Justified fully through Calvary's love, oh, what a standing is mine. And the transaction so quickly was made when as a sinner I came. Took of the offer of grace he did proffer. He saved me, oh, praise his due name. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Let's sing the first verse in the chorus again. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day, day I will never forget. After I'd wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend, he met the need of my heart. Shadows dispelling with joy, I am telling, he made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away and my night was turned to day. Heaven and glory filled my soul. Beautiful hymn. You sing that wonderfully. The other song is He Keeps Me Singing, written in 1910, and it's based on Isaiah 35.10. It says, And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. This was written by a man named Luther Bridges, he was from Kentucky. He became a very effective evangelist and pastor, and he marries and he has three sons. In 1910, Luther, he's 26 years old, he leaves his wife and kids with the in-laws because he had a preaching trip to take. One evening, that home caught on fire. And the in-laws escaped, but his wife and three sons died. So he had deep, deep depression. And it took him a long time to recover from it. But <clears throat> he wrote that the words and the music of this song came about because it was God's ability to keep him singing. This was really, he wrote, he says he wrote this for himself. But it's wonderful how this is now shared with uh, so many others. So let's sing, He Keeps Me Singing. Okay, you're, you're, you know this one too, right? Again, not over there. All right, here we go. One, two, three. There's within my heart a melody, and Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee, peace be still, and all the life's ebb and flow. 
Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. All my life was wrecked by sin and strife, discord filled my heart with pain. Jesus swept across the broken strings, stirred the slumping chords again. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Though sometimes he leads through waters deep, trials fall across the way. Though sometimes the path seems rough and steep, see his footprints all the way. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know my every longing keeps me singing as I starting with soon soon he's coming back to welcome me beyond the starry sky I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown I shall reign with him on high Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Amen. Hey, you sounded pretty good. Good job. Let me open in prayer. Thank you, Father. Uh, we sing these songs just glorifying and praising you. Uh, we worship you um, in a world of uncertainty and chaos that we see around us. You are certain because you are truth. And we put all of our trust in you because you are God. And as we look into your passage today, we see how through the Holy Spirit, we can live a victorious life, and we do not need to be fearful. So um, may we be strong in our faith, strong in our witness, and uh, thank you. Just thank you for how much you do love and care for us. So I ask your blessing on the remainder of our time here. Thank you again for the men and women uh, being here, those that could not be here. Thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, before I do the joke, 98-year-old uh, Doyle Branscombe went to be with the Lord. Our World War II vet is now with Jesus. So I um, wanted to let you know that. Um, he was, if you know Doyle, he's, we went to, uh, a few weeks ago, no, a couple months ago, we went to a uh, kind of a celebration. And so they had music, and you could get up and, and dance. Doyle's there. There's, they're playing, this is what, this man lived, in a, a, what a life. They're playing Michael Jackson Beat It, <laughs> and Doyle is out there cutting a rug. <laughs> am I not, is, am I not <laughs> Yeah, what an amazing guy. So I wanted to let you know that he is with the Lord. Yeah. He, he is. Yeah. Yeah, World War II vet and uh, very proud of it, as he should be, and uh, served over in China during World War II. Um, so we'll talk more about that. And uh, when I know some details, I'll let you know on that, too. Um, okay. Well, let me go to the joke. Are there any Catholic priests or Jewish rabbis in here? <laughs> Seeing none, I will now do a Catholic priest, Jewish rabbi joke. The punchline is you got to wait for it, okay? You got to wait for it. Just giving you a heads up. 
a Catholic priest and a Jewish rabbi are in a car crash. It's really bad. Both of their cars are total, but neither one of them is hurt. They both crawl out of their cars. The rabbi looks and says, oh, you're a priest. Well, that's interesting. I'm a rabbi. Wow, just look at our cars. There's nothing left of them, but we are not hurt. This has to be a sign from God that we should meet and be friends and live together in peace. The priest replies, oh, yes, I agree. It's a miracle that we survived, and here we are together. The rabbi then says, and here's another miracle. My car is totaled, <laughs> but this bottle of wine in the car didn't break. <laughs> God must surely want us to drink the wine to celebrate our good fortune and new friendship. So the rabbi gave the bottle of wine to the priest. The priest nods in agreement, opens the wine, drinks half of it, hands it back to the rabbi. The rabbi takes the wine and puts the cork back on it. The priest is confused. <laughs> he asks the rabbi, aren't you going to have any? The rabbi says, not right now. I think I'm going to wait until after the police show up and make their report. Uh, that's right. <laughs> yeah. <Okay. laughs> All right, we're in Acts chapter 2. Now, the biggest question that can ever be asked is simply this. What must I do to be saved. And if that's not answered correctly, no matter what your belief system is, or if you don't have a belief system, the result is eternal separation from God. And I'm going to tell you, there are many wrong answers. I'll give you three of them, and there are more. Here's one. If a person takes what I call a legal, <coughs> legal view of salvation, they believe salvation comes from a works basis. And they also believe you have to adhere to every law and commandment. And if you do that, you'll have salvation. Okay, no. Then you have a person who takes a moral view of salvation. And they believe that salvation comes from doing more good than bad. And they say, hey, I'm generally a good person. Again, no. Then you have a person who what I have, uh, I'll call it a come one, come all person who views salvation that way. And they believe everyone will have salvation because there are many, many ways to God. Okay, no. All of these views miss the mark. Peter's sermon this morning that we're going to dive into gives the correct answer to the question of how to be saved. Now, last week, if you remember, we ended, I read the entire sermon in one sitting. Today, I'm going to go back and go over that sermon, and we're going to chew on each bit of the sermon. So I hope you're hungry for the Word of God. Here we go. Acts 2, starting at verse 14. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. Okay, let me stop there. I want you to visualize what is happening. Peter is there. So are all the other apostles. I think they looked at each other, kind of looking at each other about, all right, who's going to speak? And then they all looked at Peter, and I think they nodded. He's the guy. I think Peter probably stepped forward to speak. And again, I don't think it took much prodding to get Peter to do that, because we know his personality, right? Now, he's not only going to have to speak, just so you know, logistically, he's got to speak loudly. There are thousands of people there. Now, I want you to notice something. He had no sermon notes. There was no sermon prep. There was not a written outline with four key points. He didn't spend time going over what he was going to say. None of that. And I only say that because to me it's just amazing. I mean, just for me, I, I spend like a lot of hours studying and writing this for each week. 
Matt and all the others, absolutely, a ton. Peter, through the Holy Spirit, is just speaking, and he's doing it amazingly. Peter's sermon, it's needed at this exact time. It is directly from the Lord. It is through the Holy Spirit. When you look at Peter's sermon, it's well-organized, it's direct, it's scriptural, and it's Christ-centered. To me, that should be the example of any sermon you hear today. He divides the sermon into two parts. He explains the phenomenon of the Holy Spirit that had occurred, and then he declares that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And that is specifically to answer the crowd. The crowd, if you remember, they gave him a question and then they gave him an insult. <laughs> remember they said, what does this mean? And then a lot of them were mocking and they said, ah, he's full of sweet wine. His sermon is going to answer this directly. Peter is going to address two groups of people. The first are the locals. He calls them, and if you read the passage, men of Judea. <clears throat> so those are the locals. He then also is going to address the out-of-towners. That He says all those who dwell in Jerusalem. Remember, they were there for the feast of the harvest. Now, this sermon is specifically to the Jews because he's going to highlight the Old Testament. So here we go. Verse 15. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. Okay, he gives the time of the day. For us, third hour of the day is 9 a.m. And he gives that as a reason why they are not drunk. Now, I know some of you are going to go, well, I know people who are drunk at 9 a.m. <laughs> okay, maybe so. <laughs> but historians note, if you are a religious, honorable Jew... You're not going to drink until the evening, okay? Yeah, you take that for what it's worth. So the earliest they're going to start drinking would be in the evening. They, they would not do it in the morning. Now, Peter quotes from memory, from memory, Joel, the prophet Joel. Let's read 16 through 21. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days... It shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants. In those days, I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I'm going to stop there. So here's what's going on. Peter explains that the prophet Joel predicted these amazing events of Pentecost and that the apostles, what they are doing, they are fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. He explains that Joel, for us, chapter 2, it prophesied that miraculous signs are going to be there when the Holy Spirit is given, and he refers to it as in the last days. So what Peter is saying is the last days are here. And the Old Testament promises have now begun by the work of Jesus Christ. Peter now continues and he's going to emphasize God's sovereignty over the events of Jesus' death and his resurrection. His sovereignty. Let's read about that. Verses 22 through 24. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. 
as you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. So, Peter begins by talking about the humanity of Christ. He looks at him and he says, and, I, and I, again, I paraphrase big time. He goes, you guys saw him. You know what I'm talking about. So, you have signs and wonders that validated the claims of Jesus. And what happened was at the first coming of Christ, Jesus showed everyone what his second coming kingdom is going to be like. There won't be any illness. There won't be any demon possession. There won't be any fear of, of storms. There won't be any death. The Messiah is going to reverse the curse and all things are going to be restored. You look at verse 23. Peter describes the death of Christ from both a human perspective and as well as a divine perspective. Now, Jesus was crucified as part of the plan and the foreknowledge of God. But to be clear, the people who crucified him, they're responsible for their actions. And what that means is that divine sovereignty never excuses a person's responsibility. Then Peter brings up a really painful and recent memory. Many of those people there, standing and listening to him, those people had followed the lead of the Sanhedrin in killing Jesus. Some of them probably silently gave a little okay in his killing. Others, I'm sure, were more actively involved. So again, I want you to visualize what's going on. You got people squirming. You got people uncomfortable. You got people probably talking under their breaths, breaths and saying, oh my goodness, what, what's he doing? Because he's saying that Jesus was put to death by them. Now notice, you got, you got Peter speaking to thousands of people. He has no fear. He is fearless at this time. And just a few weeks before, he's cowering. He's denying Christ. He is now indwelt with the Holy Spirit, and he holds nothing back. You go back to verse 23. Go to the end of that verse. He refers to them as lawless men. Okay, another way to say that is godless men. That means pagan. This had to have literally pierced them to the heart because Peter is indicting every one of them. Now, speaking of that death, we know is a consequence of sin. But because Christ was sinless, death had no power over him once he paid the full penalty of sin. And then you go to verse 24. Peter tells the people about the amazing thing that God did. He raised Jesus up. Now, notice Peter. He shares God actively involved in this process. So God knew ahead of time and had Jesus die on the cross and then raised him again. And by doing so, he overcame death. Okay, his sermon continues. He is now going to reinforce by quoting, and again I say this, uh, by memory. I keep saying that because I don't do well with the memorization. I should do better. But I'm just amazing at, at, at what he's done here. He does from memory, without preparation, he reads or recites Psalm 16, 8 through 11. This is a song that was written by King David. It's about King David's own death and that his hope of resurrection is through the Lord. So let's read it. Verses 25 through 28. For David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken therefore my heart was glad my tongue rejoiced my flesh also will dwell in hope for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your holy one 
see correction. You have made known to me the path of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Okay, what that passage shows is that the Old Testament anticipated the resurrection of Christ. Go back to verse 27. David prophesied, he says, For you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One, okay, that's Jesus, or let your Holy One see corruption. He continues, and now he's going to tell them what the Scripture predicted. Verses 29 through 32. Let's read it. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses. Okay, so Peter explains that David, he experienced death. He's still dead. Jesus, he was resurrected. He's alive today. Okay, so what is, what is David talking about? Okay, now remember, we, we were talking about King David. He's a prophet also. And he's speaking of one of his descendants. Go back to verse 30. Okay, that's what Peter is saying. He says, and that descendant is Jesus Christ. He descended from the tribe of Judah and the line of David. He doesn't stop with the resurrection. He wants to give more confirmation that Jesus' identity as the Messiah. So we continue. Notice again, this is really well organized as he's going through it. And it's very, very scriptural. He's, it's very Christ-centered. Verses 33 through 35. Being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Okay, this is really powerful. Again, I want you to, again, think of Peter and the other followers of Jesus after the resurrection and before his ascension to, he to heaven. They had personally seen him. They had heard him speak. They ate with him. They touched his physical body. And for over a month, they were taught by him. And then they saw what only the Son of Man could do. He ascended to heaven. Peter uses Psalm 110. That's the passage Jesus used also when he was talking with these snooty religious leaders in Luke chapter 20. And Peter makes the same point as Jesus did, and it's this. David could not have been talking about himself sitting at the right hand of the Father. It could only be Jesus. Peter now is going to conclude his sermon with a straight-up declaration that Jesus is king, and people should submit to him and him only. He argued and he proved that Old Testament scripture, it revealed the identity of Jesus. So go to verse 36. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Okay, 
So Peter is saying, hey, Jesus is really the true king. You need to stand in awe of him. You need to confess him as Lord. That is Peter's message. He says, he uses the phrase, know with certainty. Okay, that it's a fact. It's 100% true. Jesus is the ascended king. Peter must have gave us a sigh out as he finished. <laughs> this is his very first sermon. How was that sermon received by this throng of people that are listening to him? Let's read about it. Verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? Okay, first off, Peter. I, you got to, he must have been just overwhelmed with just joy at the response. Um, I, I call that great encouragement. First time preacher. And again, I'm sure in his mind, he's thinking about his failures that he had previously. And now he's been forgiven and Holy Spirit is in him. And he preaches his heart out and the people respond Okay, what do we do? Now, their response there is exactly what Jesus said about the Holy Spirit. Let me read this to you. It's in John 16, 8 through 11. Here's what Jesus said, talking about the Holy Spirit. He says, and when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin and of God's righteousness and of the coming judgment. The world's sin is that it refuses to believe in me. Righteousness is available because I go to the Father and you will see me no more. Judgment will come because the ruler of this world has already been judged. Holy Spirit is convicting. Now, Peter's sermon shows how the Holy Spirit, it takes the gospel, it works in people's hearts. The result is conviction from that repentance, which results in conversion, if we say salvation. So Peter is not going to give an answer, and it's not 12 steps to this and that. It's not uh, four paragraphs long. It is, again, concise, and it's to the point. Verse 38, and Peter said to them, repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, let me, let me slow down. Let me go over this for a minute or two. The first thing Peter says is to repent. You don't hear that word used much today. It's a critical first step. Repent literally means to turn around. It means to go in the opposite direction. It requires a change of mind. It requires you to turn away from everything God has declared wrong. It means you reverse course and you seek God's help in doing what he says is right. Now, be, I want to be clear. Repentance is not regret. It is not remorse. Judas had remorse. He did not repent. And instead of seeking God's forgiveness and turning to him, he hung himself. Feeling sad about the consequences of sin, that is not enough. A person shows true repentance by a genuine hatred of sin and a desire to never engage in that again. And instead, through the Holy Spirit's guidance, to obey the Lord. Repentance and then faith, therefore, it goes hand in hand. You can't place your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior without first changing your mind about your sin and about who Jesus is and what he has done. So step one is to repent. Turn from your old self into your new self with Christ as you accept him as Lord and Savior. What does Peter say next? He goes, and be baptized. He says, be baptized. Let's, let's talk about that for a minute. Baptism is an outward expression 
of an inward change. It's an outward demonstration of the inward reality of Jesus Christ now in a person's life. It is not a requirement for salvation. Baptism does not save. You are saved through the repenting of your sins and accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You don't need to be baptized to be saved. But if you are saved, you will want to follow and be baptized. Peter gives another uh, step. He goes, every one of you, and he says something, we, we say this a lot. He says, in the name of Jesus Christ. You're to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That means through the authority of Jesus Christ. Um, let, me give you, let me give you a present day example. Let's imagine some of your friends are allowing you to attend a concert. And you're going to get to use their season tickets. The tickets are in their names but they can assign the privileges to you. They just tell the ticket office that you have the okay to attend. And so then you're going to be given all the privileges of a season ticket holder. Your admittance isn't on your authority. It's on the authority of the ticket holder. And so it is. It says in the name of Jesus Christ. Finally, Peter says, all who turn from sin and trust in Jesus will be indwelt with the Holy Spirit. Let's read this, verse 39. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Okay. That simply means that salvation involves God's sovereign activity. Peter says that the Lord is calling people to himself. We're going to read further down in Acts 13, 48. It's going to say, all who had been appointed to eternal life believed. Now, for us, we should be excited by this as we evangelize, as we tell others the good news. Keep lifting up Christ and pray for the Holy Spirit to convict people and lead them to repentance and salvation. So let's finish this. Verses 40 and 41. Here are the results. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, Save yourself from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Okay. Now, we do not know how long Peter preached. If you read the sermon that's here, it takes about three minutes. I'm sure he spoke longer, and we know that because it says, and with many other words. That means Dr. Luke honed the content down to the essential parts, okay? The results are amazing. By the end of the day, the church had gone from 120 to 3,000. Now, I want you to remember what this means. We all, we all go, hooray, this is great, which it is. Remember what they now have. You have 3,000 brand new Christians. They were untrained. They were not taught. They had no church handbook. They had no guidelines. They had no church building to meet. This is where discipleship kicks in. Again, just, discipleship doesn't end with conversion, with salvation. It begins with that, but it continues. And this is where discipleship is going to be kicking in. These are new believers. And the first thing they did was baptize them. They immersed in water. Luke doesn't tell us where, doesn't tell us how, doesn't tell us by whom. Frankly, not important. But he does give us three facts, and they're very important. Okay, here's no, fact number one. They accepted Peter's preaching as truth. They believed what he said. They repented and they began to follow Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Fact two, they were baptized. Because that identified them publicly as followers of Christ. It gave them a strong sense of belonging. And I'm going to say it probably put a mark on them for all those that were non-believers that did not agree with that. And fact three, 
it says they were added. So in a single day, it grew by 3,000 souls. We close here by reading about the first local church. I have just enough time to read the passage all the way through. And then next week, I'm going to spend the entire time next week going over this passage. And it's verses 42 through 47. This is what I would call a church in its prime. It had purity of devotion to the resurrected Lord. Unmatched. Unmatched. But I'm going to talk about in detail what it really looked like. You know this passage very well. I want to read it all the way through and then close with it. Just a couple quick comments. Verses 42 through 47. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Okay, well, we've only spent a few weeks going through the book of Acts. We've already seen how the Holy Spirit works to accomplish his primary purpose of exalting Jesus. I mean, we've already read so much to encourage us because you and I, we have the necessary equipment to talk to others. We have the Holy Spirit and we have the Word of God. These two things allow us to know God's will in our lives. And so with that, you can speak and act confidently. We also have seen how the Holy Spirit convicts people of sin. It leads them to repentance. So we end here with this new church with 3,000 people are now citizens in God's kingdom. So this is going to set us up for next week about this community of faith. And each one of us are going to see how important it is, I'm going to emphasize this, in belonging to a biblical community of followers of Christ. Amen? Hey, let's pray. Thank you, Father, for this passage. I just get excited just reading it and just uh, thinking how your Holy Spirit worked in that setting, and it, it continues to this day. Um, may we lean on you, the Holy Spirit, to help us and to guide us, to uh, give us the words to say, the actions that you want us to do, uh, to help keep us encouraged, uh, again, in this world that we're in. Um, but let us be a light that you want us to be. Thank you again for your word that is given. Thank you again for uh, Peter and being bold in what we did. We, we talk about him being just, you know, the extrovert. To do that, I was thinking if I had to do I don't know if how, I don't know how any of them could do it, but they did through the Holy Spirit, and that's a wonderful thing. Please bless these men and women as they go about their week and having a smile on their face and a purpose in life. We ask all this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Enjoy the hallway out there. Thank you. Thank you.